Well, hey, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Uh, it's the first time in the Half King. I've gone by it many times, but I've never been inside, so this is nice. Um, I just want to thank, of course, Scribner and Betsy and people that really helped me get this book out into the world. Um, this book is, uh, I'm going to read from the book, of course, but I don't want to give away too much because this first chapter is going to describe why I wrote this book. So maybe I should just read the first chapter, then I'll talk a little bit about the book, kind of expand what it's about. Um, okay, I'm going to read the first chapter. first chapter is called Tainted Vegetables, and it starts with a little uh, tagline. It says, I like my town with a little drop of poison by Tom Waits. Every spring I plant a garden, a, a small but noble pursuit, small in the sense that there are many more important items on the daily calendars of our lives, but noble because each step of self-sustainability has a lovely feeling of beating the ever-invasive food industry at its own game. In my line of work, I travel a lot, sometimes to places where food is measured by cups of rice a week and water is delivered to homes by 10-year-olds who have walked five miles through desolation to get to a well. Planting a garden is a way of keeping the harsh realities of the world at bay. It seems the same practice in a world hell-bent on destroying itself. When home, I try to talk to the plants every day. I grew up on a farm, so speaking to budding pomegranates seems natural to me, sometimes more than speaking to my neighbors. Peaches and apricots are good listeners, too. I go to them for comfort. I trust the plants, and the seeds, although invisible, give great solace as they incubate in the ground. This particular spring carries a special meaning for me. My wife is pregnant with my, our second daughter, and our two-year-old is eager to take on the chores of watering and helping her dad with the daily garden duties. My plan is to create a large vegetable garden in the backyard area where we have never used. It is situated between two tall trees, perfect for morning and afternoon sun, but shaded during midday. After two full weekends of digging, raking, and trips to the hardware store, I complete the drip irrigation system. My daughter and I spend a Sunday morning planting squash, tomatoes, lettuce, spring onions, jalapenos, green peppers, several herbs, including basil, thyme, and chives. And each morning for weeks thereafter, I wake with the sun to see how much the garden has grown overnight. In the beginning, the progress is slow, but soon the vegetables burst through the thin layer of dirt and begin to morph into yellow, red, and green. After six weeks, six weeks of daily attention, I collect my first batch of spring lettuce. I coddle each leaf as I, as I wash it in the sink. And finally, I prepare a salad for dinner. My wife won't, let, won't eat the lettuce or any other item from the garden. She's not a food snob, but she knows she's careful what she eats because the baby grows inside of her. I argue the food is as organic as we're going to find, and she replies that, that she doesn't trust the dirt. And she has a point. We live in Bisbee, Arizona, a small hamlet couched in the Mule Mountains, a mile above sea level. Bisbee is a, a dormant mining town located eight miles from the Mexican border as a crow flies. The copper mine closed down more than 30 years ago, but the effects of the existence remain. Mine shafts pockmark the hillsides, and sulfuric acid runoff stains the cliffs of burnt orange. Giant head frames dot the horizon, remind reminders of the elevators the size of houses used to carry men a thousand feet below the surface. And then there's the open pit, a large crater on the edge of town where all the water from our torrential rain, rain, monsoon rains pour off the mountains into the mile-long giant bathtub. I'm going to take my coat off. It's hot up here with these lights. They're really hot. Uh, I, guess it, I guess that lights have to be on though, don't they? Wow. Uh, my wife and I met in Bisbee not long after we had moved here in 2000, mostly to get away from anything resembling suburbia. As I've passed through the decades, I realize there I have a few steadfast requirements for what I call quality of life. Most important is not driving in traffic at all. I need to walk out my front door to a good hiking trail. I also like the ability to barter if money is short for any vital necessity. In Bisbee, I've always been able to trade one of my books for a meal, a poker buy-in, a bottle of wine, or all three. Money's required here, but bartering is accepted. In Bisbee, no two houses are quite alike. In fact, they are spectacularly different, reflecting the individual owners who built them more than 100 years ago. And several streets are so narrow that driving down them requires bending the mirrors inward to avoid clipping them off. Gas lines run exposed up stairways, occasionally doubling as railings. 
and each homeowner must adapt to the nuances of his or her home, and no manual exists to help with repairs. Local plumbers and electricians have to throw their training out the window because no job in town resembles that of a modern day house. Hang on a second. Every small town possesses certain intangibles that manage to unite its people. In the case of Bisbee, is the aforementioned crater on the southern edge of town, simply known as the pit. It sits at the edge of town like a cancerous tumor that no one wants to talk about. Measuring half a mile wide, almost one mile long, and 950 feet deep, the hole was once an open pit mine where miners found gold, lead, zinc, turquoise, uranium, and silver. But the big money was always copper. By the time Fels Dobbs turned off the machines in 1975, the pit had produced more than $8 billion in copper. To live in Bisbee, must, one, one must accept the pit as part of one's life. It defines each resident's sense of geography and creeps into the town's daily language. If a local gives directions to a tourist anywhere east or south of town, his first words in, are invariably contain the words, once you drive past the pit, if I drive to the only supermarket in town, I pass the pit. If I go to the hardware store, I pass the pit. If I go to the vet, the ballpark, Mexico, the breakfast cafe, the cemetery, or any of the town's schools, or to the dump, I pass this massive hole in the ground. In a single day, I may pass the pit a half a dozen times. And yet, shockingly, in only a matter of months of living in Bisbee, the pit does not exist as a large hole, only as a black canvas upon which our eyes paint sky and mountains. And soon this enormous scar on the earth becomes the same as a tree at the end of the block, or a traffic light, or an old barn that everyone uses as a local landmark. Bisbee is no ordinary mining town. In its heyday, it was one of the largest copper towns in the United States. And Phelps Dodge, then the owners of the mine and once the political and economic alpha force of Arizona, owned almost every large copper mine in the state. In 2007, Freeport McMoran bought the Bisbee mining operation and everything else Phelps Dodge owned throughout the world for $25 billion, including mines in Africa and Chile. Freeport now owns a majority of the land to the north and south of Bisbee. They own the dormant mine, they own 2,700 miles of mining tunnels that run beneath the town. They own the same parcels. They own some parcels of the mountains, sections of outlying deserts, and many buildings in town. And even though they don't own most of the homes, at times it feels like the only things they don't control or own are the people in the sky. As part of the transaction with Phelps Dodge, Freeport assumed an obligation to reclaim all the polluted soil in Bisbee neighborhoods. And by 2008, Freeport began a program that calls Soil Reclamation which means they're testing every household in Bisbee to check for contaminants in the yards. I applied for Freeport to check our soil, which they did, but that was months ago. A team of geologists, chemists, environmental engineers walked the perimeter of our house, probing the soil to a depth of two feet. No one would ever answer my questions other than to say the results would be ready in several weeks. Months passed, so I assumed our soil was fine. Meanwhile, spring waits for no one and I want to grow food. I want to teach my daughter it's possible to eat from our backyard and not Safeway. The first night I eat a salad from my yard, my wife eats something else. As much as my daughter likes gardening, she doesn't like salads or anything remotely resembling a vegetable. She opts for macaroni and cheese. The salad tastes delicious, but knowing came, that it came from our backyard makes it even more scrumptious. I do this daily, sometimes twice daily, for two weeks each time feeling great pride in my efforts as a gardener. One night I have a nagging headache, which intensifies the following night. My stomach feels nauseous. I tell myself the headache and nausea are a result of a bug going around town. One night I wake up with quite different sensation altogether. I have diarrhea and severe cramping in my stomach. Crawling to the toilet, I throw up again and again. At this point I'm nervous, thinking I have a serious illness. And my mind goes where so many in America go, medical insurance, which I don't have. This cycle of physical sickness and mental anguish goes on for another week. In that time, I've stopped eating anything other than basic staples. After several mo more days, I'm able to walk and to eat once again. I forgot all about the garden. I don't even care that it exists. Feeling better, I walk to the post office to pick up my mail. I pick through the bills and notice a letter from Shaw. I read the letter a few times before its meaning registers. My front yard has 564 parts per million of lead, 32% higher than the acceptable levels. In my backyard, where the lettuce 
peppers and spring onions are flourishing. At this very moment, the soil has arsenic levels of 79.3 parts per million or more than 100.